Benvenuti a... Welcome to this uh, meeting, uh, one of the last uh, of uh, the Festival of Economics uh, 2017. The subject uh, that uh, we are going to focus on in this uh, session is extremely topical in the world. Uh, up to some time ago, we would have said in the Western world, uh, but now the problem is extending also to developing countries. Uh, and the problem is that of obesity. And uh, as we are at the Festival of Economics, uh, we want to focus on the uh, relation between obesity and uh, economy or economics. Uh, and the topic will be dealt with uh, by an expert, a world expert, uh, Dr. Kirsten Strombotny. I hope I pronounced it uh, correctly. It is a Norwegian uh, uh, type of uh, uh, family name. She is uh, a health economist and works at the American Institute of Research, uh, Washington, D.C., the capital city of the U.S. And she deals, uh, and she has been dealing with this topic for more than 10 years. And she uh, tackles the issue from different uh, viewpoints trying also to provide uh, recommendations or guidelines uh, for policymakers. You know that obesity is a sort of uh, an epidemic which has uh, uh, repercussions on health, production, longevity. So it has uh, a large spectrum uh, impact uh, on many aspects of our life, personal and social life. So I'll stop here and I give the floor to Dr. Strombotny who will speak about this topic, and then at the end of her speech, if there is time, we will uh, collect some questions. Thank you. Grazie, Luigi. Um, I'm sorry, this is going to be in English, and I'll try to speak as slow as possible um, for the translators in the back. Just to give you a little bit of background, my name is Kirsten Strombotny. I'm very happy and very grateful to be here with you all discussing um, obesity. Um, I'm going to come at it from the perspective of American obesity, and I'll focus as well on Italian obesity with the caveat that I'm still learning about the incidence of this disease in your country as well. I want to talk about the economics of obesity, and what does that mean? What do economists have to say about obesity as a topic? Well, we believe that obesity is ultimately the result of a series of dynamic decisions, and what I mean by dynamic decisions is decisions over time, uh, regarding health behaviors, what we eat, how much we eat of it, uh, how active we are. And understanding how individuals make trade-offs uh, between food, physical activity, and weight gain and weight loss, um, the market forces that influence those actions, the consequences of those actions, and the role of policy in addressing the consequences are all topics that economists may have particularly useful insights into. So just to give you an idea of what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to present some background on obesity with the assumption that not everyone is as familiar with this topic um, and related behaviors. And I'm going to talk about the drivers or what I believe are the drivers of this disease. I'll go over the consequences, both the financial and the health consequences, talk a little bit about economic theory, and I promise I won't get too technical or jargony, um, discuss some policy options, and then talk about where I think we go for, from here, both for my country and maybe for your country as well. So let's talk, what is obesity? When we say obesity, what are we talking about? I'm going to refer to something called BMI, which stands for Body Mass Index. In adults, you measure it by dividing your mass, so in kilograms, divided by your height squared. So you can see this is a, a chart where how this works is you would take your height, so I'll, my height is 173 centimeters, so it would go over on the chart, and then you go upwards, 
You find your weight, and then you classify your BMI based on your weight for heights, right? And so in general, if you fall in that green bucket, we say you have a normal weight. If you fall in the yellow bucket, we say you're overweight. And if you fall in the red bucket, that's when we say you're obese. There are other ways to measure obesity. Um, you could do it by body fat percentage, waist circumference, waist to hip ratio, skin fold thickness. Um, this measure is imperfect for a number of reasons, but we use it because it's easy to collect data on height and weight in a lot of people. Now, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about childhood obesity today too and we measure childhood obesity a little bit differently. Um, and that's because children grow in non-linear ways. So for those of you who have children and you've taken them to the pediatrician, the pediatrician will show you a growth chart and you can see where your child or how your child is developing in relationship to these kind of growth curves. So for children, we wanna look at weight and height within age and gender categories. So it's an imperfect measure again, but this is kind of where we're at in terms of measurement. So let's, let's look at obesity rates in Italy. You guys are actually, um, relative to most OECD countries, have very low obesity rates here. Maybe about one in 10 individuals are obese. Um, the OECD average is one in six, and you can see in my country it's far worse. It's about one in three, and this is obesity. Well, when we look at overweight, so that was that yellow category I showed you in the first chart, Italians are about 40% overweight, so that includes obesity. And what you'll, what you'll notice for Italian adults from this graph, you can see in the red line, you don't really see the same trends in growth that you see in, say, the US or England. Um, I don't know if that's just because your data is, doesn't go as far back or if you don't have the same trends, but it's um, ultimately an empirical question. These are global prevalence of obesity, so let's just kind of um, look relative to the rest of the world. The way to interpret this graph is countries that have darker blue have higher prevalence of obesity, and countries that have lighter blue have lower prevalence. So for females, these are all female specific, the world average is about 11%. So Italian, Italians actually have a lower percentage of obesity than the world average. Uh, the lowest would be Bangladesh, Vietnam, and then you can see there are pockets of the world that are really problematic. The Pacific region, Southeast Asia, have very high obesity rates, as do um, the uh, Americas and the Middle East. Prevalence and the pattern looks fairly similar when you look at men, um, although you can see if you just compare colors, I'll do a quick switch. Men are generally less obese than women worldwide. So I, I talked about a trend, and I wanna show you the trend for the prevalence of obesity over time in the US. And this graph starts in 1960, but if you were to draw this line out to the 1900s, it would look relatively stable at about 10%. And what you'll notice is that in the 1970s and 1980s, we get a really big spike in obesity rates in the US. So you've probably read the newspaper, heard the news stories about different hypotheses for what's driving global obesity, what drives the epidemic. And what I want to um, make salient from this graph is any hypothesis that we consider needs to be able to explain that really rapid increase. So if you were to say something like, obesity is caused by genetics, 
you would also have to be willing to make the argument that something about our genetics changed quite starkly in the 1970s to explain the rise in obesity rates. This is another graph, and we won't spend too much time here, but it shows different um, categories of obesity. So this light bottom area is overweight over time, the darker green is obesity, and then the gray is extreme obesity. And what I want you to take away from this chart is that the growth in obesity rates are happening at the highest values of obesity. And I have one more way to show this. Again, these are different categories of obesity growth rates. You can see that it's really extreme obesity that's driving this problem in the US. And I'll come back to the geography of Italy, but I wanna show, these are graphs. I'm gonna present to you a series of 25 graphs, and they're gonna show obesity rates by state over time. And what you'll see is that the spread of obesity really looks a lot like a contagious disease or a pandemic. So I'll explain in words, but just to show you, the light blue is gonna be under 10% obesity, and then as we get into the yellow and reds, it's higher rates, so here we go. So by 2010, you can see that there's no state in the US that has under 10% obesity. That's, <laughs> that's alarming. So I said Italians have low obesity rates, but that's Italian adults. When we look at Italian children, we see a different story. So this graph is showing rates of child overweight. And what you'll see is that relative to other OECD countries, Italy is actually not doing great at all. Second to Greece in overweight amongst children. And this is particularly problematic because what we know about obesity is once you become obese, there's really no going back on average. Now, that can change from individual to individual, but what we see in American data is once you move into a different category, you really only move up from there. We don't see people moving down. So when I look at this, I think, uh-oh, Italy's in, in for some problems in the years to come. This is a graph um, that is from a great paper I was reading this weekend that shows variation in Italy in child overweight by province. And what you can see is that southern provinces have higher rates of child obesity, northern provinces have lower rates, and from my basic understanding about Italy, these would also correlate with very, various socioeconomic factors. Um, so this conference is about inequalities in health. And we see inequalities in obesity. We see inequalities in income. Um, you can see that the poorest Americans have higher rates of obesity than the uh, more wealthy Americans. Although uh, the group for whom obesity is growing fastest, this purple group, is actually the wealthier American. So, it is an unequal disease, but it does touch everyone. The story is a, a little more nuanced when we break it down by females and by ethnicity. So for females, we see a pretty um, typical, what you would think to see about obesity. Um, as your income in increases, the propensity to be obese decreases. For males, it's a little bit different. We, we see that same trend for white males in the US, 
but for African American and Hispanic males, we actually see either an inverse relationship or a U-shaped relationship between income and obesity. We see disparities by education. So these are um, Italian rates of obesity. Women with poor education here are three times more likely to be overweight than educated women. Uh, the same is true for men, um, though to a lesser extent. Similarly, Italians from southern provinces, low income, um, rural areas are more likely to be obese. And obesity is actually, a, this was interesting to me and maybe someone in the audience can explain. Um, we, out, we also see higher levels of obesity in women who completely abstain or report abstaining from alcohol consumption. So what happened? This is all pretty rapid. It's pretty scary, at least to me. The economic argument is that, and, and I believe economics are at the heart of the obesity epidemic, the argument is that economic forces have made it easier and cheaper to consume high energy, tasty, affordable food, and have made it ex more expensive, and I mean expensive in economic costs, to be physically active. Moreover, medical advances have lowered the health costs and consequences, if not the financial costs, that result from excess weight and have perhaps decreased the motivation to diet and exercise. So in other words, the obesity uh, epidemic is a direct result in changes in relative prices or costs that promote excess food consumption and decrease physical activity. So let me show you some data to back up that claim. The first claim is that it's cheaper to consume more calories. And I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through this graph in a second. But in general, when we think about economics, one of the basic laws for normal goods is that when prices decrease, the quantity demanded is expected to increase. And the demand for food is no exception. During the past several decades in the US, food prices have actually been steadily dropping. And I know these look like rises, but I'll explain why in a moment. Since 1978, our food prices have dropped 40% relative to other goods and services. So what's even more relevant is that high calorie foods have become much cheaper than more healthful alternatives. So what you're looking in, at in this graph is the CPI, which is the consumer price index. So this isn't inflation adjusted. This dark blue line is the CPI for all foods and beverages since 1982. And what you'll see, or what I want you to see, is that since 1983, when this graph starts, the prices of fresh fruits and vegetables um, all fruits and vegetables, fish, and dairy products have increased um, by 190%, 140%, and 100% respectively. But when you look at fats and oils, sugars and sweets, and carbonated beverages, they increase at much lower rates, 70, 66, and 32% respectively. We think much of the decrease in these relative prices is the result of food technology that disproportionately affects processed foods. So that could be through technology like freeze drying, um, vacuum packing, uh, and the discovery and mass production of high fructose corn syrup. In addition to falling monetary costs, I think that technology has also decreased the amount of time and energy it takes to prepare food. So decreasing non-monetary costs 
are also expected to increase consumption. For example, you have the widespread availability of the microwave oven, uh, which has made it even easier for prepackaged food. Today, 95% of U.S. homes have a microwave. That's practically everyone, compared to 8% 30 years ago. We also see decreases in the acquisition cost of food, um, which is supported by the sheer volume of restaurants and cafeterias and snack bars and vending machines. This is, this is actually a picture from a really great New York Times article that was about Italy. This is a picture from a shopping mall in Trentino. I think, is it Ro Ro Rovetta, Rovereta? Okay. This is amazing to me. I saw one of these in Trento. You have vending machines that make pizza. This is shocking, right? <laughs> these options were not available 20, 30 years ago. Right? And much of the increase in calorie consumption, when you look at the data on average calorie consumption over time, much of that increase occurs between meals, so snacks. Now, although the cost of calorie consumption has decreased, the cost of expending those calories has increased significantly. And I mean the cost in terms of all cost, right? So consider energy expenditure in the workplace. As a result of advances in workplace technology, even the most blue-collar occupations, I don't know if that word translates, blue-collar means um, more mechanical, um, even those jobs have been automated to the point where employees burn very few calories in the workplace. This technology allows employees to be increasingly productive um, and to earn a higher wage as a result, but it comes partly at the expense of growing waistlines. Um, you know, it's, it's not only that jobs that burn large numbers of calories are increasingly hard to find, but they pay also low wages. So it's hard to imagine people would be willing to take a substantial pay cut for a few extra pounds of weight loss. One strategy to offset the increase in calories consumed and the decrease in calories expended in the workplace is to increase your leisure time, um, physical activity. So this is a graph of gym membership over time in the US with the caveat that gym membership doesn't necessarily mean people actually go to the gym. Um, but you can see that increasingly, we're thinking about ways to use our leisure time for physical activity. However, that too requires significant cost when one considers what needs to be given up to engage in that activity, right? If we're earning more money, the opportunity cost of the leisure time is higher. We also means we're um, you know, using a host of new technologies, which include computers, the internet, video games, television. These are all sedentary behaviors that have to be traded off for that physical activity in leisure time. And finally, the last piece of this argument is that it's just cheaper, or it's less expensive, to be obese, right? The, this too is based on economics. It says that a as a result of advances in medical technology, the, uh, the health consequences of being obese have decreased. So there's been a tremendous increase in the medical, the pharmacologic, and surgical treatments for the risk factors and diseases that obesity promotes, which suggests that the health consequences, which are one form of the cost of obesity, are not as great as they once were. 
For example, many drugs and surgical procedures have been introduced over the past 40 years that treat cholesterol, high blood pressure, uh, you can buy insulin medication, the, the consequences from having diabetes are less severe, and partly um, these technologies are even subsidized by our insurance companies or by publicly funded health programs. So really the costs are decreased. And partly as a result of these new technologies, obese adults, in the US at least, have better blood pressure and better cholesterol than they did 30, 40 years ago. So this discussion is not meant to suggest that obesity is not bad for one's health. Obesity adversely affects nearly every system of the human body and it greatly increases the risk of numerous health conditions, especially diabetes, and it's associated with most of the non-communicable chronic diseases, including stroke, um, lung disease, cancers, heart diseases, gout, arthritis, sleep apnea, throughout the body. Moreover, the financial consequences are incredible. A very conservative estimate of what this costs the US from a year-to-year -year basis is $147 billion. Most of that, or a little more than half of that, is the direct medical cost of treating the diseases I showed you on the previous slide. The other half comes from lost productivity in the workplace. So we know that individuals who are obese earn less money, they show up to their jobs less frequently, and there are estimates that say being obese and having the conditions associated with being obese make you less productive on the job. So what do we do about all this? What should we do and what can we do? The appropriate policy response really depends on your view of human behavior and our relationship to food, right? Do we choose to be obese? How does this story change if we believe that there are addictive components to what we consume? To answer this question, I want to present to you three different forms, three different economic models of the way of looking at human behavior and the way we consume and make trade-offs with respect to addictive substances. Now, when you go to your introductory economics course, you learn individuals are perfectly rational. We walk around with these kind of utility maximizing functions in our head. We, you know, make perfect trade-offs. Now, we don't actually ever see the utility functions in each other's heads, so we have to make assumptions that people are behaving rationally. What if they're not? Well, that changes the interpretation of how and whether we should regulate obesity-related behaviors. So I'm going to present to you three models. The first is a completely irrational model of addiction. The second is a completely rational model of addiction. And the third is going to be a host of models in between. The first, this very irrational model, is called the myopic model. And in this view of human behavior, you would have to think that humans have no forward-looking behavior. Right? We're perfectly obsessed with the donut, with the drug, with cigarettes, with alcohol, and that we have, in economic terms, high or perfectly priced inelastic demand for the substance. That means I can change the price of the substance and your demand stays the same. Right? In this case, if we believe that there are problems with the consumption of the good, right, we believe there's externalities associated with being obese, the appropriate policy response is total prohibition. Right? If you're not responsible to prices, then we ban the substance. This has unintended consequences. 
saw with the prohibition of alcohol, it can create black markets and raise crime rates. We also might worry that food, sugar, fat, salt, aren't addictive substances for everybody. So can you ban it for everybody? Can you just completely get rid of food? And which kind of food? What about the evidence? Does the evidence say that we're actually price sensitive? I'm going to show you some price sensitivities for food, but first I want to show you some addictive substances so you can get an idea of how they relate to each other. So for instance, when we look at how your consumption of alcohol changes in response to the price of alcohol, we see that for an alcoholic, for a very heavy drinker, that price elasticity is essentially zero. You can change the price and people will consume alcohol in most forms. We've seen it in a very extreme case in Russia where people will actually resort to drinking um, you know, car fluids, the windshield wiper fluids, any kind of alcohol. That's a zero price elasticity. Something like cocaine, you see has an elasticity of about negative 0.3, negative 0.4. Cigarettes, we think, are elastic. So the consumption of smoking actually responds pretty well to changing prices, which may also be a reason why we saw really effective smoking and cigarette taxes in the U.S. Now, food is no different. Food is generally price inelastic. So in economic terms, again, that means that you can change the price and your behavior change um, is less than the change of the price. I don't know if that's, that's the way it's going. Um, it's not surprising that food pr uh, is price inelastic, right? We all need food to survive. We all have to eat every day. Um, but you can see that there are differences by the type of food. So of all of these, the one that you're most likely to give up in response to an increase in price is going to be fast food or food in a restaurant, then soft drinks. Um, you can see sweets and sugars are fairly inelastic. That's kind of about the same estimate we saw for cocaine, which is interesting for a host of reasons. And then e eggs are the most inelastic, which is slightly strange to me. So if we don't think we're myopic, we don't think we're completely irrational with respect to food, are we completely rational? Is it the case that forces in the markets, technology, have changed our relative prices and it's just more costly to be thin than it is to be overweight, right? If we believe that humans are completely rational, then we would interpret the rise in obesity as a rational response to prices, and those include all economic prices, right? This is the idea that consumers are maximizing their utility with all the costs in mind across the entire lifespan, right? If actors are completely rational, they respond to incentives, and it implies uh, a wider range of potential policy lovers in, in response to um, externalities of obesity, right? That could include taxing, legal penalties, informational campaigns, etc. I'll talk about a couple of these initiatives. The one that receives the most attention in our country are food taxes, sin taxes, kind of as a mean to recuperate costs associated with obesity. Um, although a number of state and local governments have recently initiated soda taxes, so that's a tax on carbonated or sweetened beverages, economists disagree over the extent to which these taxes are appropriate. So you might think there's some really important differences about taxing food and taxing, say, cigarettes, alcohol, or illicit substances. 
For instance, a cigarette is a single substance. It's very easy to target. But if you want to target a tax at food, what do you target? Do you target total food? If you want to reduce calories, that seems not right. Sugar? What kind of sugar? Sugar occurs naturally in many foods. It occurs um, in fruit. You get it in dairy products. There are added sweeteners. If you tax sugar, the people change to fake sugar. And is that any better for you? Do you tax soda? Well, if you tax soda, what's the cross-price elasticity? What kind of effect does that have on the consumption of, say, fruit juice or candy bars? These are all really important questions that don't have clear answers. But they, in the US at least, soda presents kind of the easiest target. There have been many studies showing associations between soda consumption and weight gain. And this is what policymakers have chosen to focus on. Another problem with these taxes are that they could be regressive. And what I mean by regressive is that a tax like a soda tax, impacts um, the poor more than it does the wealthy, right? The counter argument to that argument is that those are also individuals who may be most likely to benefit from the taxes, but that's, that's the argument. Now, um, existing studies are actually show mixed effectiveness in how well these taxes actually address obesity. Um, my colleague and co-author Eric Finkelstein has estimated that you'd need a 40% tax on sodas to achieve just a one pound decrease in body weight, the 0.6 kilos about um, per person. So that's a really high tax. And even when you see changes in pur purchasing behavior, they don't necessarily translate to clinically meaningful outcomes. Another uh, policy that's popular and has been put forward is the provision of information, right? So if you believe one of the, the problems with obesity is stemming from the fact that people just don't know what's healthy for them, or they don't have the appropriate information, then the obvious thing to do is provide the public with information. It's everyone's favorite strategy. It imposes very little cost. And people who don't want to use the information don't have to use it. Right? Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's not that effective. So for those of you who were in uh, Professor Ashenfelter's lecture yesterday saw that he presented on the, um, the McWage. Actually, it's giving it away, so I'm which, and the way he measures the McWage is by looking at it, the price of a Big Mac, French fries, and a soda, right? And when you go to McDonald's in the U.S., there's a law now that McDonald's has to post the calories um, for each of their menu items, right? So my blockers aren't working very well. But basically, a Big Mac, French fry, and Coke is 1,200 calories. Right? Does anyone know how many calories you're supposed to have in a day? Some people do. Well, this is a big problem with menu labeling, is that not many people know. So if you don't know what to do with this information, it's not particularly useful. You'll also see that calories are presented in ranges. So if you order, what is that, a, a number three, the double quarter pounder, it could be anywhere from 750 calories to 1,400 calories, right? And we don't see these policies changing purchasing behavior. So we certainly don't see them changing weight. Um, there are many reasons for this. One is that you may not know how many calories you should consume in a day. There have been some great qualitative studies showing that um, these numbers are hard to interpret. Um, people could go into restaurants compensating for other meals. You could go into the store already knowing what you wanted. 
these foods could be habit forming or addictive. Um, and mostly the cost of preparing something healthy at home far exceeds the $4 that you'll pay for over half of the calories that you need in a day, right? So if you're a single mother, you're working all day, you need to feed your children, you don't have a lot of money, this is the cheapest option and the quickest option. You don't have to think about preparing the meal, go to the grocery store, bring it home, cook it, serve it, clean it. It's easy and it's cheap and it's high in calories. Now, what if we think our behavior is actually someplace in between completely irrational and completely rational, right? We're still price sensitive, but what if we're just making mistakes? And when you talk to real people, not economists, this seems to jive with our experience of eating food and our experience with sugar and desserts and gelatos and sodas. There are a number of models that explain something somewhere in between. Jonathan Gruber, who spoke here yesterday, has a really great model looking at time and consistent preferences. So that's the idea that you would um, hyperbolically discount into the future. We may be sensitive to cues and marketing. We may have self-control problems, right? We may not want to do it, but feel compelled to do it. And we may make mistakes, right? And if this is the reality, we may want to consider additional policies. So we call them libertarian paternalistic policies. And the idea here is that you essentially want to help people help themselves. Right? Um, this is a picture of Odysseus, and he's tied himself to the mass because um, he knows the sirens are calling and that if he hears them, he's not going to have any self-control. So he kind of pre-commits to, um, to, to binding himself. And it's the metaphor that we use for many of these nudge policies or policies that help us maintain our self-control. Um, one of these policies is increasing taxes to not just reflecting the externalities of your behavior, but also the internalities of your behavior. They could include things like changing the default. So there are some really interesting studies showing that if you just move Let's say you're in a, a buffet line. If you just move the desserts from the, end, from the beginning to the end, people consume less desserts, right? Go figure, it shouldn't make sense from a rational utility optimizing perspective, but it does make sense from um, a, a psychological and human perspective. These could include policies like paying people to lose weight, so financial incentives and then manipulating how you give them out, so through lotteries or sweepstakes. And then um, pre-commitment devices, so things like a gym membership, where you're paying money um, up front with the thought that you have to be healthy. Um, there's also, there's some really fun websites. Dean Carlin from Yale has one called Stick, where you can pay money up front. You make a pledge and you say, um, this year, I'm gonna lose 10 kilos. Here's $500. And if I don't lose um, 10 kilos, you can donate that $500 to the worst charity I can think of. So um, if you are um, maybe on the left side politically, you could um, promise to give it to the far right policy and the far right political party the idea being that that outcome is so horrible, you've pre-committed to lose 10K. So we actually see in the US a lot of these um, kind of behavioral nudge ideas popping up. So where do we go from here? What do we do with all of this? We've clearly got an obesity problem. It's being driven by technology, right? And if it's being driven by technologies that help us live better lives, we may not be comfortable with rolling back those technologies for the sake 
of losing weight, right? First of all, we need effective policies. Unfortunately, most of the policies I've presented to you don't show effectiveness in isolation, right? This may be because we still need to do quite a bit of research onto what's actually causing obesity. The relative importance of different behaviors, is it what we eat, how much we move, and is it total number of calories or specific types of calories like carbohydrates or sugar, are those the real demons in the diet? And then we also need evidence-based theories of behaviors. So I presented three different models of economic behavior to you, but from an empirical standpoint, it's very, very difficult to test those models, to test between them. The data requirements are incredible. And finally, I think we need a systemic approach. And I, I usually hate when people talk about a problem and then recommend a systemic approach because it sounds like a, an easy response. But I want to show you some pictures of what we're dealing with, at least in the US, and what could be coming your way. This is a pharmacy in the US. This is where we go to get the drugs that are supposed to make us healthy. This may actually be an OK pharmacy. They're serving some bananas, it looks like. Um, but you can see that as you approach the checkout, it's just temptation. Right? This is a sporting goods store. This is where you go to buy things to help you be physically active. And if you look closely, what you'll see is that every checkout counter, you can buy candy. This is a bookstore. This is where you would go to buy books, presumably about being healthy. Also, as you walk through the line to check out, temptation, candy, food. This is a linen store. This is where you go to buy pillows and sheets. Right? It's ubiquitous, right? So these are the kind of problems that we're up against, the market forces that are incredibly strong. In my own personal opinion, I think where we should be focusing all of our efforts are on schools and for our children, right? Nobody believes that our children are perfectly rational and that we make kids make utility maximizing decisions with the lifetime consequences of those decisions in mind. Um, I think the most promising systemic approach is to target our efforts at banning junk food in school, certainly um, regulating or banning the marketing of food and sugar towards children. Um, and that includes on the internet and by television, and then providing funding to increase physical activity time in public schools. Um, and maybe some of those things would be useful for the Italian childhood obesity crisis as well. So I think that's my time, and um, thank you very much. Well, I found your presentation extremely interesting and original. Uh, from my viewpoint, uh, for a person uh, like uh, myself who normally deals with health, I write for the Corriere della Sera about health. Uh, well, whenever I um, look at things uh, not uh, from the viewpoint of cause and effects and uh, consequences, in terms of calories and uh, consequences, well, I see that everything changes. Everything uh, takes up uh, a more uh, comprehensive uh, uh, dimension, uh, a complex dimension. And the fact uh, that this uh, presentation has been uh, fantastic in terms of quality, uh, well, I understand that uh, from the fact uh, that I took some notes about questions. Uh, and at every slide, you already answered my questions. Uh, so you answered all the questions uh, that I had wrote down. Uh, so now I'm a bit in a difficulty because I don't know what uh, questions to make. Uh, anyway, 
Let's hear if you have questions or comments uh, for our speaker. I'm sure she will be happy to answer. Please, uh, go ahead. Don't be shy, you're not shy. Good afternoon. In your opinion, depression uh, can have an impact uh, on obesity and uh, if we treat uh, depression, uh, do you think that it might be easier to find uh, another way so that the person can help uh, him or herself uh, to solve the problem? Thank you. So it's, um, it's a nuanced question. It, it, it's a question that requires a nuanced answer because it's difficult to disentangle the relationship between depression or even psychological stress or various mental health conditions and obesity. Which one comes first? Does solving the obesity solve the health? Does solving the health solve the obesity? Um, but I think it, it points to you know, the fact that there are a lot of other things that drive our eating behaviors beyond cost, right? And one of, you know, one of the, the things that I didn't touch on is that there could be kind of multiplier effects given our new environment. So it may be that some people's genetics um, do worse off in this kind of high calorie processed food environment. It could be that some people um, do better or worse given their mental health state. So I think it's... Um, it's ultimately an empirical question, and I, I don't have the, the full answer for you. Prego. Eh, ah, scusi. Prego, prego, scusi. Io volevo chiedere. Well, I see a connection between economic factors and obesity, both at the time when food is produced, I'm thinking of uh, big industrial husbandries, uh, uh, and then the push uh, to eat uh, meat, uh, and then the excessive use of cereals, and then I think of Monsanto, which has a connection with uh, um, Bayer, uh, and uh, not even Obama uh, did uh, what he had promised. Uh, and by the way, Bayer produces uh, uh, drugs uh, for heart diseases, uh, so there are big, big companies uh, out there. And then we tell people that they have to face off uh, this uh, economic power, but it is these uh, big companies which cause obesity, and then we tell individuals uh, who work 10 hours, they don't have time to uh, prepare food, because uh, in Western countries, uh, there is very little time available to cook, uh, while in India, they spend uh, four hours, in America, half an hour. So uh, there is no time to cook, and on the other hand, uh, there is a huge army of uh, uh, economic powers. Uh, so it all, se it all seems very disproportionate to me. So I think you touched on a lot of issues in your um, statement. One big one, which for those of you who were at the panel discussion on Friday, has a lot to do with the framing of the problem. So uh, there's a whole other way to approach this topic, which is to think about the political feasibility of policies that may be effective. And believe it or not, we don't have universal support for these policies in the U.S., and I think it's because of something you said, which is there are a lot of people who see obesity as a personal failing, right, as um, someone who is irresponsible with their health and isn't making the right choices. And in that case, um, what do we really want to do to help those people with their own tax dollars? The other side of, of the story, or the, the flip side, is that we're all victims of the market, right? And if we're kind of at the whims of um, companies with big lobbying power and a lot of money um, who have vested interests 
in seeing that we're obese and in profiting off our health outcomes, um, that's a very different way to tell this story and it opens up um, a lot more policy options, I think. One other thing you touched on is kind of agricultural policies and how those may affect what we eat. So one hypothesis that's put forward in the U.S. is that we subsidize corn production, say. And then the idea would be that um, the subsidizing of the corn makes the ingredients cheaper, like high fructose corn syrup, and therefore reduces the price of these kind of high calorie, um, high fructose corn syrup products. In actuality, farm policy, at least in the U.S., is a lot more complicated than that. Oftentimes, um, subsidies and quotas and acreage rules will cancel each other out. And when you actually look at how much um, of the price the fructose, fructose corn syrup plays, so for example, a soda, actually two cents on the dollar of every soda comes from the ingredients. Most of it is the price of the aluminum that the soda is served in. So, um, yes, agricultural policies could play a role. The evidence, in my opinion, hasn't shown that they do thus far. Um, I hope I touched on all of the elements you listed. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your beautiful and very clear presentation. I have two questions. We saw in the beginning a map of the world. And so my question is, the phenomena that we see in Egypt uh, and in the Middle East uh, and elsewhere, do they follow the same pattern that uh, was followed or that happened in the United States, or is there a difference? And then, based on your studies, have, been, have there been cases where there were incentives at tax levels, meaning, I don't know, whether you can deduct the gym fee from your, tax, from your taxes. Has that been done? And if so, with what effect? Has this triggered a virtuous type of behavior or not? Those are great, great questions. Uh, the first question about global obesity rates. These are harder questions to answer because we don't have the same kind of empirical data for the world that we have, not even for Italy, that we have in the U.S. Um, so what I would tell you would be a lot of speculation. You mentioned the Middle East in particular, and one hypothesis that's gaining a lot of traction is that it has to do in particular with sugary beverages um, or uh, soda consumption because these are areas of the world where alcohol is not consumed in as high rates. Um, but again, that's conjecture, and I'm not an expert in global obesity. Um, your second question is about financial incentives to lose weight and how effective they are. There are so many studies about this, and um, people try to change the timing of the payment. If we say, we'll give you $100 per pound, or you have a 1 in 10 chance of $1,000 or $10,000 per pound. Um, what if we pay your favorite chair? I mean, you can test it in any number of ways, but the bottom line is, is what we see are really minimal reductions in weight loss that disappear over the long term. So even if I can design um, an intervention that uses financial incentives to help you lose weight, even if I see effectiveness in the short term, in virtually every study, when you follow up a few years later, you'll see a return to the original weight or even increases from the original weight. So they tend to work while the study is happening um, and not so much from a long-term perspective. At the time, a lot of these trials for financial incentives were popular we also kind of started to think about ways that your employer 
may also incentivize you to lose weight. In the U.S., a lot of um, people are insured through their employers, so the employer has a vested interest in making sure you're healthy. So the employer will offer um, benefit programs for prevention um, with, with the hope that your health expenditures will decrease or won't be as high. One problem with that is that in the U.S. at least, we see a lot of um, mobility between jobs. So employers don't necessarily have um, incentives to invest a lot of money in your health if you're not going to stay at the company for longer than five years. So um, it's a question that many, many people are thinking about but as a single strategy for um, intervention hasn't shown big promise. Thank you, it was interesting. Um, I wanted to ask you, you spoke about uh, um, provision of information and especially in the menu, but I was wondering about uh, processed food and packaged food and uh, stuff like traffic light labeling and the relationship with, between this type of provision of information and inequalities. And then last thing, I was a bit disappointed by the name uh, tax because it puts a stigma on it. So I, I, I'm pretty sure shared the thought with me, but I really don't like to call it syntax. That's it, thank you. We'll call it a Pagovian tax. For you. <laughs> um, so the, the question is about uh, informational, provision of information. So the example I gave is about menu labeling which is actually law now in the U.S. for restaurants or franchises that have more than 20 locations. The Obamacare ACA law required that they post their calories, and largely we've seen that that policy has been ineffective. So then what other kinds of provision of information can we think about? Well, you can look at nutrition labeling in the grocery store. Um, the evidence shows that people have a hard time disentangling all of the information that's presented. You know, you get calories, fat, grams, sugar, percentage, micronutrients. I'm not sure exactly what Italian nutrition labels look like. What's more promising are labels that are kind of heuristics. So these could be one you mentioned is a stop stoplight, a traffic light. So just on the cover of the, the box have a green light, a yellow light, or a red light to indicate buy, don't buy, definitely don't buy. The problem with these kind of labels is that it then becomes political how you rate them. Who gets a gold star? Who gets the heart approved? Who's a green light? Um, I spoke a little bit on Friday, as well. I think you were there, that there are these kind of nutrition wars that exist outside the scope of my presentation, and they're really bitter battles between nutritionists who believe that obesity is uh, a problem of caloric imbalance, right? It's like you just, you consume too many calories and you don't expend enough, in which case, if that's what you believe, you really want to signal individuals to buy low-calorie food options. But there's an entirely different camp that believes obesity is a problem of specific calories. So sugar, um, carbohydrates, calories that promote insulin secretion and fat storage. And if this is your belief, then you really want to incentivize or signal to the consumer that you should buy low sugar. Uh, some people believe in low fat, right? So there's no real consensus from the experts on what it is you should be eating to be healthy. And then you add into that all of the kind of vested interests that this woman had asked about, and it becomes a, a real boondoggle, a, real, <laughs> a little bit chaotic to um, figure out the best way of signaling healthy food options. So it's, it's, a, it's a very nuanced topic.
mi sembra I, I, hello, I'm here. I think that uh, we also have to talk about the right information and uh, I uh, heard uh, the question about uh, food and depression and I think that this is a, a different uh, domain in that a number of uh, um, diseases uh, uh, have some do, do, don't have anything to do with that. It could be that there is a person with depression who eats a lot and is always uh, hungry and uh, vice versa as well. Oftentimes uh, I read that uh, good and reliable institutes uh, developed a number of uh, not expensive uh, diets. Uh, I read uh, in uh, the daily Corriere della Sera about a diet which is the SMART diet and the Oncology Institute has approved of it the, and uh, there uh, of course uh, we would have uh, a possibility but what is important, what I mean is uh, that people have to be told about the various options. Uh, so information is key. I'm sorry, I did not understand whether you are criticizing the smart diet or wh whether you are inviting us to inform people about that. I'm sorry, I did not understand. No, uh, I, I was not criticizing or saying the opposite. What I meant uh, is that uh, it seems uh, I, I understood what you said, but I didn't understand the point. What I mean is that we should all be informed about the effects of what we eat in terms of making us live longer, not develop cancer. And I made reference to one article I read in the Corriere della Sera. I, I'm not being polemic. I simply uh, asked because I didn't understand fully what you meant. I, I, but I think you touch on something interesting, which is that there are many diets, and many of those diets offer different recommendations that may be at odds with each other. Um, I was at the the festival bookstore. You can go in the in the square, and there's a whole table that has diet books, which all, which all say you should do different things, right? So there's um, one says you should be vegan, one says you should eat Mediterranean diet, one says low fat, one says um, Atkins, lots of meat. And what are you supposed to do with all of this information as a consumer when even the experts don't agree? Um, so I think it touches off the question from the side of the room earlier, which is it, it's very difficult to make policy recommendations and can be very dangerous when you don't have the complete information about what it is, what the, the right diet is, and whether it's right for everybody. If I may, I would like to conclude with a personal observation, unless there is another question. There is apparently another question. What is a good diet for a child? So what should I eat being a child? I think you have to ask Luigi, the, the physician, <laughs> maybe what your parents tell you. Uh, <laughs> I will try and give a serious answer. I do not know what is a good diet for a child because I'm not a nutritionist. I'm a physician but not a nutritionist. I think that a child during the age of development needs to have a very varied diet in line with the demand for energy because y you have a growing, developing body. You, uh, uh, 
use uh, a lot of energy also uh, at basal level and you move more as a child than an adult for obvious reasons. So you use up more energy and you should receive the essential nutrients. I think that we should all agree on the fact uh, that we all should be educated uh, to um, go for the right taste. If you are taught as a child to appreciate a lot candies and sweets that in the United States you also find in pharmacies, then you get dependent in a way, you are addicted to that. And uh, that is one thing, but if you replace sweets with fruit, then possibly you will continue eating fruit as an adult. So uh, nutritional education is key, and uh, that will help us appreciate uh, what is good to our body and not uh, the opposite. And diet should be varied and should be also rich, rich in uh, uh, reasonable uh, approaches. It is very true that diet uh, say different things because there is a market for diets as well. This is the reason why you have one name or the other in diet. I don't want to mention names because I don't want to be sued. But the point is that several studies uh, tell us that all diets work in the short term. All diets in the short term means uh, that you eat in an orderly way, possibly less than you normally do. So they all work in the short term. And you say, well, I did that diet, is wonderful. And uh, you suggest a friend doing that. But people do not see what happens after one year. And after one year, you gained again the same weight and perhaps an extra kilo. So you see, what works in the long term is a sustainable diet, which is something that is good for our palate and is in line with our needs. Normally, the diet that works uh, better is the one that we can tolerate better. But it's not only a question of rules, it's a question of personal decisions, uh, it's a question of motivation. Indeed, uh, there is another thing that is oftentimes mentioned. Some people say sugars are to blame, and then it's fats, and then it's proteins, and nutritionists uh, are uh, uh, told that they never uh, uh, give one final word. But I must defend them, and I must tell you that studying the effect of individual nutrients on health is sort of difficult. It is very difficult to isolate the effect of one nutrient vis-a-vis uh, -vis all the other nutri nutrients uh, that are taken in together with the, with the first one. So oh, it, it is so that we acquire new knowledge all the time, and this is progress. Uh, trials and errors is the process uh, that we follow in science. It is a development, it is an evolution. We know today that uh, uh, too much salt is bad, and 20 years ago it was fat. Uh, and it, is, it was not a political decision uh, at all. Simply, we did not know 20 years ago that salt was not good. Today, we have to be aware of the fact that also nutritional science evolves. And I would like to state once again that the receipt to uh, pick the right uh, diet is something that has to do with being the reasonable. There is one mistake that we all have to avoid, and it is that of always eating the same things. That is always wrong. Uh, you should prefer vegetables and fruit uh, and reduce animal fat and uh, uh, simple sugars. That is uh, obvious. We all know that. I have said that. I'm sorry, but I know that it was not necessary. Now, I would like to thank so much uh, Kirsten Strombotny for her wonderful contribution. Thank you so much. A round uh, of hand for you. And uh, thanks uh, to the audience uh, uh, for being here. And uh, since Tito Boeri, the organizer of the festival, is here, he also deserves a hand for organizing this very beautiful festival. <laughs>